I'm here today with Jack Fairweather, who is a journalist and war correspondent. He has written this absolutely fantastic book, uh, The Volunteer, which has won the Costa Prize. And we're currently on the Pilecki train. And we're here to talk about all about Pilecki and we're on our way to Berlin. So I think we should start with Pilecki before the war. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Sure. P um, Pilecki, before the advent of World War II, was a gentleman farmer in eastern Poland. He was a, a local landowner. He worked closely with the community, a social activist. Uh, he was married uh, and had two, uh, two lovely kids. He was, of course, Polish, Catholic and, uh, and a man of faith. And fatefully, he was also a member of the Polish Reserve uh, Cavalry, which meant that when the Germans began mobilizing, his unit was called up. He had trained a small detachment of local, local men from his village. And um, just before the outbreak of war, he uh, traveled with his units to the front lines. You've touched on the Second World War. Let's carry on with that subject. So the Germans invade on the 1st of September 1939, uh, the Soviets on the 17th of September 1939. What was Pilecki doing and where was he? So Pilecki's unit was a reconnaissance unit um, on horse. And whilst um, that idea of Polish cavalry riding horses against tanks is being generally shown to be untrue, in fact, there were serious tank battles um, during the German invasion. Pilecki did ride his horse because that was the quickest way to be able to scout out um, the advance of German forces. Um, he actually came close to one of the main panzer division thrusts towards Warsaw and you know this first experience of Blitzkrieg um, was you know was devastating for Polish defenses. They were having to hold the line across hundreds of miles of the German-Polish border and the Germans were able to break through at multiple points. And Pileski's men were forced back and broken up and he went on during the subsequent fighting to rally his forces and play a sort of guerrilla uh, warfare role against uh, German units, but in the end he bowed to the inevitable and recognized that the Polish military had been defeated. He then, like every Polish military man, faced that choice. What do you do now? Do you lay down your arms and accept uh, the German occupation or do you continue to fight on against it? Pileski's uh, unit was um, broken up during the retreat towards Warsaw and um, he then formed a, a guerrilla unit with other members of the Polish military and they fought on for some weeks, uh, you know, a, a desperate battle against the German military. But then he, Pilecki, uh, like every Polish military officer, was faced with that choice. Do they lay down their arms and accept the occupation or do you find some new way to resist the Germans? And Pilecki with um, the group of men he was with um, decided that they would travel to Warsaw and form a resistance cell and go underground and that that's how they would continue to fight on against the Germans. And Pilecki arrived in Warsaw in November 1939 and uh, formed one of the very first cells to resist uh, the Germans. This was um, you know, an incredibly bleak time for Poland. Britain and France had declared war against Germany, but they were not doing anything essentially. This is the period of time known as the Phony War. That gave Germans a, a free hand to impose their racial ideology on Poland and in, on, in Warsaw in particular. Um, that meant uh, essentially eliminating Polish intellectual class, ruling class. Um, the German idea was that the Poles should be uh, slaves to the Third Reich and should not have education, you know, beyond 
high school, you know, teenage years, and they would simply help the, their new German masters rule. Uh, rule. Um, this was also the beginning of uh, the special treatment towards Poland's Jewish population. Um, first orders for them to wear the Star of David, for their shops to be appropriated and businesses, and for the first ghettos to be built. And Polecki and other members of the Polish underground, you know, realized that they couldn't hope to overthrow the Germans at this stage. What they could do, they hoped, was draw attention of the world to what was happening in Poland. And um, the leadership of the Polish underground that began to form over the autumn and winter of 1939 and into the spring began to send reports, uh, secret reports across Europe to France uh, and to Britain detailing the atrocities. In May 1940, the Germans opened the Auschwitz concentration camp. Do you know what? Let's stick with that. You've mentioned Auschwitz because it plays a much bigger role than what literally you've just mentioned. How does Pilecki get involved in Auschwitz and where does this take the story? In the spring of 1940, the Germans begin a fresh reign of terror against the Polish population. They are arresting hundreds of men from the streets of Warsaw and other cities. The prisons that they've taken over across the country are overflowing and they decide to build a new concentration camp, the first outside of Germany as a special holding place for Polish nationals. And that camp opens outside the small town of Oswinchim in old Polish military barracks in May 1940. Um, the Germans have rechristened the town Auschwitz and this is the start of the history of the camp. Um, the first prisoners arrive in June 1940 and the underground in Warsaw is desperate to find out what this new, this new tool of terror is. Um, they get some reports, uh, but they don't know. And they realize that this could be a significant new, new form of terror. They need someone to, from the underground, to go to the camp and try and report on what's happening there. And that's when they turn to Paletsky and his extraordinary act of courage begins. So what does he do in Auschwitz? Talk us through that. So Paletsky's mission, um, is kind of mind boggling to think about, is to infiltrate the camp and then form a resistance cell and try and smuggle out reports to tell the world what's happening in Auschwitz. And uh, Paletsky learns of a roundup um, that's going to happen in the Zollibosch district of Warsaw and arranges for himself to get arrested in the hopes that he will then get sent to the camp. And, you know, for me, it's one of the great acts of heroism of World War II. Uh, that early dawn when he's sitting in an apartment building in Zollibosch waiting to get arrested. Um, the building caretaker, when the trucks, the German trucks arrive, gives him several chances, several warnings, get out. You know, he knocks on the door, tells Paletsky, this is your chance to escape. But, you know, Paletsky sits, sits there, waits for the Germans to get him. And a few days later, he arrives in Auschwitz. And I, his description in his later writings of that arrival is very powerful. It was the most shocking thing that had happened to him in his life, um, this arrival in the camp where the German guards, you know, deliberately haze the prisoners. There's shootings, beatings, they're stripped and shaved and given numbers in place of names and of the next following days they begin the sort of backbreaking work of working in labor detachments around the camp and you know prisoners are dying there's no food there's an atmosphere of terror at all moments and 
you know, Paletsky somehow has to find the wherewithal to begin his mission. So what was his mission at the end of the day? So Paletsky, you know, he was in Auschwitz for the underground to report on the camp. He is alone, surrounded by prisoners who are brutalized, starving, being beaten to death. He begins reaching out to fellow prisoners and saying, I am here for the underground. Let's join forces and try and begin some form of resistance. Um, it's, it's truly a courageous act. Um, and he begins to work out how to send reports to Warsaw. A couple of prisoners um, are released and he's able to approach one of them and pass on his first report to the underground along with a plea, a desperate plea to the Allies, which um, when I came across this report in the archives in London, um, sort of gave, gave me goosebumps to, to read it. He begs the Polish government to arrange for Auschwitz to be bombed, even if it means killing everyone inside the camp, because even then in October 1940, when he passes on this message to to the underground, he realizes that what's happening in Auschwitz is so terrible, it has to be stopped at, at all costs. And, you know, that is the first report Paletsky sends from the camp. Um, during the course of research, I discovered that there were 10 or more even reports that Paletsky smuggled out. And I think one of the reasons why his work is so historically important is that Paletsky arrived in the camp at its very beginning when it was a place for suffering for Polish nationals. That meant he witnessed the steps to, by which Auschwitz was transformed into the center of the Holocaust. And Paletsky's mission, he didn't know it when he arrived in Auschwitz, how could he, but his mission became understanding the steps by which the Nazis arrived at the final solution. And that act of understanding, that act of chronicling, recording, and then sharing um, this information became his mission at incredible personal risk for himself, for his men. If any of them were ever discovered uh, smuggling reports, they would have all been shot. Um, but that didn't deter Paletsky. He reported, first of all, on what happened to Polish prisoners in the camp, their terrible treatment at the hands of the Germans, then the first euthanasia of sick prisoners, um, then the arrival of Soviet POWs who were, um, who were gassed in some cases, the first gassing experiments um, took place then. And then, of course, the start of the Holocaust. And we, you know, we know about the Holocaust today. We have a word for it. I think one of the things I found really striking about Paletsky's work is that what he was witnessing ha had no name. Um, in fact, when he sort of wrote about it in one of his uh, reports, he just could only think to call it a new nightmare. Because what could you call? What could you call it? Um, and you know, I, that gave me a certain insight in some ways as to why, as Paletsky's reports began to reach uh, Britain and America, um, why they weren't immediately acted upon, because of course, everyone was struggling to understand how these crimes were possible. I think everyone who comes to the Holocaust today also has that struggle to understand. So by 1943, Paletsky been in the camp for over two years and um, he's starting to realize that his pleas for action from the Allies is just not having an effect. And that pushes him to his final act of courage in the camp, which is a desperate attempt to escape himself and to try and plead with the underground in Warsaw to attack the camp. And it's, um, it's, it's one of the great escapes 
I think, from any uh, prison camp during the war. Paletsky and two other prisoners um, arranged to get begin work on a baking unit that works outside the camp in a in a special bakery and uh, to produce bread for the SS men and the camp. And in the middle of the night, they sort of burst out the building and run for it um, with the guards in pursuit and managed to steal their way across um, occupied Poland to a safe house outside Krakow. And there, Paletsky begins to write uh, a report um, describing his underground in the camp, how they're ready to take action, to rise up against the Germans if they could just have some support from the outside world. And this is one of the very first attempts by anyone to put into words what is happening in Auschwitz, to write a history of the camp, along with this final plea for action. And, you know, Paletsky travels then to Warsaw to try and meet with the undergrounds, but what he finds himself caught up in is the much greater events of the war at this time in 1943-44. The, the tide has turned against the Germans. The Russians are now advancing rapidly towards, uh, towards Poland. And for the underground in Warsaw, it's looking like they're having to face perhaps a Soviet occupation that would follow immediately after the defeat of Germany. And this is the moment that Paletsky finds himself in um, the events that lead to the Warsaw Uprising in 1944, um, that Paletsky played a prominent role fighting during the uprising. Um, you know, he realized that this was the existential battle facing Poland at that moment. And, you know, he, he is ultimately, like the underground, de defeated during the uprising and goes into captivity again with the Germans until the end of the war. And he watches from afar as Poland is occupied by the Russians. Um, you know, I think many people who come to Paletsky's story think at this point, you know, he has done something truly remarkable in getting himself into Auschwitz, spending two and a half years in the camp, reporting on the Nazis' crimes, calling on the Allies for action, escaping the camp, fighting during the Warsaw Uprising. Surely this has to be um, the moment when he can rest. Um, but, you know, I think what many people in Britain and America, myself included, before I began researching Paletsky's story um, don't realize is that in with the defeat of Nazi Germany that didn't mark the end of the war for much of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. In fact this was just the beginning of the Soviet domination of Eastern Europe and the loss of freedom for so many millions of people. Um, the communist authorities imposed by Stalin on Poland immediately began arresting members of the underground who had fought against the Nazi occupation. Paletsky um, left uh, the prison camp he was in in Germany and went back to Poland to fight on against the Soviet occupation. And the tragedy of his story um, is that he was caught by the communists, put on a show trial and executed. And then all trace of his wartime record deleted from history um, or hidden in military archives. And that's one of the reasons why so few people outside Poland have heard of him is that his legacy was, was deliberately buried by the communist authorities for, for decades. Um, Paletsky's own family didn't know the details of his mission to Auschwitz until the fall of the Iron Curtain, where they were finally able to gain access to some of Paletsky's writings about his time in the camp. And it's meant that whilst in Poland, his legacy has begun to be celebrated and recognized, um, there's been a, been a lag in that broader recognition. Um, I spent the last five years 
writing and researching Paletsky's story to try and share it with an international audience. And you know, my hope is that we can all begin to recognize him as one of the great heroes of World War II. I just find it so extraordinary that a man who survived Auschwitz, where many, many didn't, he then goes on to survive the occupation. He then goes on to survive the Warsaw Uprising, where 180,000 people don't, um, to then be caught up in one occupation that crosses over for another, to then be put on a show trial, tortured, because he was heavily tortured at this point, wasn't he, during that whole time period as well? Yeah, well, there's that. There's a comment he made to his wife during the trial when um, it was a brief moment when they were able to to speak during the during the show trial, and he said Auschwitz was a game compared to this. He had been tortured for six months over 180 different interrogations, most of which began and ended with brutal torture of Paletsky and Maria recounted to her children afterwards how Paletsky had been hiding his hands during the trial because he didn't want to show Maria that his his fingernails had been ripped out during the interrogation. Um, it's, um, it's, it's very hard to read the interrogation files that have finally been made accessible to researchers reading Paletsky's words after being tortured and thinking about his suffering at that time. Jack and I have just gotten off the train and we're now here in Berlin, in the Pilecki Institute. We've come to this absolutely phenomenal exhibition about Vitor Pilecki and we're gonna go and explore. So what actually inspired you to write the book? I came across Vitor Pilecki's story by chance. I'd been a war reporter in Iraq and Afghanistan for 10 years and had left the war zone behind and was trying to make sense of my experience when I met a friend who had been to Auschwitz and had learned about a resistance cell in the camp. And I remember just being so blown away by that idea. I think for lots of people, Auschwitz is a death factory. And the idea that resistance is possible in a place like that is completely unexpected, completely shocking. And that idea um, stayed with me. Um, a few years later, Paletsky's report um, that he wrote in 1945 was finally translated into English and I read it and then I knew who it was who had performed that extraordinary act of resistance in the camp. I love that, that's totally like your defining moment really isn't it? It's that Rwan report that just was the wow factor for you. Yes, well it's a, it's a great story. Yeah, so this is one of my favourite rooms in the exhibition and here is a replica of Vitold's sabre that he war when he rode off to war to fight the Germans in September 1939. And this was lent to the exhibition by his son, Andrzej Paletsky, who uh, um, kept it with him in his Warsaw apartment for many, many years. So coming back to uh, the conversation we had earlier on the train about Paletsky's arrival and what he experienced in the camp, I think we should do a little bit about that, I mean, here we've got, what have we got? We've got some prisoner stripes. So of course, after arriving in the train, the carriage doors are thrown open and the capos, the prisoner functionaries who are already at the camp, drag out Paletsky and the other prisoners and they're beaten and dragged into the main camp and then put through this ritual of being shaved, stripped of their clothes, washed with either ice cold water or boiling hot water. And then they collect their prisoner stripes. And Paletsky and many prisoners actually describe that experience as feeling like they were losing their 
their selves, their sense of identity, shorn of all their belongings and turned into prisoner numbers like the one we have right here, which was um, actually a number very close to Pletsky's. This is a real prisoner number that was um, from, from the camp. And then obviously they were uh, given the red triangle for political prisoners and, and PIFA for Poles at the end of the day. That's one thing that it's really important to understand about the beginning of the camp was that it was created for Polish nationals and that everyone there was Polish. They might be Catholic or Jewish or Protestant, but they were all Polish. This was intended, the camp, to crush the Polish spirit of resistance. I mean, I'm going to throw in an exception in here for you because I did, as we were walking in here, spot the photograph of Otto Kuzel. I mean, he is a prisoner that I, I love to research him because so far I have not found one negative review or one negative word that has ever been said about him. And he was prisoner number two from the first 30 that arrived in, in May 1940, which we talked about earlier on the train, very briefly. That's right. So the, the first prisoners were, in fact, German um, imports from Germany. They were prisoners like Otto Kuzel, whom the SS expected to help them run the camp and enforce their brutal order. And you'll see right next to Otto's picture is a truncheon from the camp, that sort of weapon that was used by the capos to beat the arriving Polish prisoners. Most of the capos were sadistic, brutal men who abused their positions and killed wantonly and sadistically in the camp. The exception um, from those German capos is Otto Kuzel, who in fact saved Paletsky's life early on in the camp by helping him um, find a, a work detail that could protect him um, away from the murderous designs of the other capos and he did that so many times in the camp. Um, I, I share with you Alina that feeling that everyone should know Otto Kuzel's name because... Exactly, he is just, I, I would refer to him the angel of Auschwitz because he was. Yes. He saved so many, so many lives, he's just absolutely incredible. I, I completely, completely agree and you know I think after the war uh, the Polish prisoners rallied round and tried to persuade him to move to Poland and gave him, you know, gave him lots of, uh, lots of praise because in post-war Germany, Otto Kuzel went to live in a quite sort of quiet life in Bavaria. He was somewhat ostracized by the mm. local community because they were like, who is this prisoner? He must have done something wrong. And it's, um, it's sad to think that Otto Kuzel could not be recognized as we... Um, recognize him today and it's uh, I really wanted to have him featured in this exhibition. Oh, thank you. There are some absolutely amazing objects in this exhibition. Some, I agree and some of them I find you know so deeply poignant. There's the shoes from the transport, um, there's a canister of Zyklon B gas that was used to kill prisoners. Um, these were items that were donated by the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum. Um, here we have a tablet that shows, uh, it's a printing tablet for instructional booklet for how SS guards should treat um, arriving transports. Um, one of the items that I found really incredible because it's directly connected to Paletsky's story is right around the corner here. So I'd love to show oh, it to you. Oh, fantastic. Let's go have a look. So this is one of the artifacts that's most connected to Paletsky's story. It's um, a spanner that um, he actually used during his incredible escape from the camp. Um, this spanner was used to undo some of the bolts on the door of the bakery from which he escaped. And incredibly, this was carried um, in their hands as they sprinted um, away from the camp and made its way all the way to a safe house in Krakow where many years later uh, it was handed in to a, a small museum um, in the nearby town and as soon as I heard that this spanner still existed I, I knew it would be the right thing to show here in the exhibition because I think that idea that Paletsky's hand was there turning the screws that um, is just very powerful. I love this. Thank you so much for showing me. But you mentioned earlier, I think we had a conversation yesterday, you mentioned something about a desk. 
Yes, that's just around the corner here. And this is a really extraordinary item. It was um, the table in the safe house where Pletsky sheltered immediately after leaving the camp. Um, this was the table where he would have his first meals of, you know, relative freedom, where he could finally unwind a little bit from the camp. It was also the table where we believe he wrote his first report about wow. Auschwitz. And this was a very special report because it was not just uh, an attempt to explain his experience, describe um, the underground that he'd formed in Auschwitz. It was also a, a plea for the Polish exile government, for the Allies to take action to stop the, the horrors that he had left behind. And they didn't, did they? They didn't. And, um, you know, I think um, Pilecki, when he sat at this table, was still had hope that something would be done to stop the horror of Auschwitz. And um, he was to be cruelly disappointed. There have been some absolutely amazing objects that we've seen that have belonged to Pilecki, that have come from the Auschwitz Museum. Is there anything else you want to show me today? Yes, this is... Um, a really extraordinary artifact that takes us to the very end of Pilecki's life. Um, he fought on at the end of World War II against the communist takeover of Poland and he was captured and put on a show trial and ultimately executed. Um, just before his death, um, he had a chance to meet Maria, his wife, and he handed her a copy of a book he had been reading um, during his months of incarceration, during a period when he was tortured and interrogated regularly. And the book he read um, was one that meant a lot to him throughout his life. It was Thomas Akempis's The Imitation of Christ. And Pilecki drew some solace, um, we think, from that text. And he wanted to share it with Maria and to pass on the message to his kids that they should read it too. But I think one of the takeaways for people who uh, encounter Pilecki's story, come to the exhibition, is not his grim end, but this incredible act of courage that sustained him during his time in the camp. That bravery that he showed time and time again to record the crimes of the Nazis. and. He was a figure who inspired so many prisoners in the camp to join him in the underground. They saved hundreds of lives within their group through that act of inspiration. And I really felt um, after spending five years following in Pilecki's footsteps that here was one of the greatest heroes of World War II. And I think he can serve as a, as a real inspiration for us today. Jack, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure being able to see this fantastic exhibition and to see all these amazing objects. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you come to Berlin to the Pilecki Institute.